And it is now my uh, really definite delightful pleasure to introduce Dr. Lena Hobart. She's our next speaker. Uh, Lena Hobart is part of the team of uh, Professor Wolf at the University of Innsbruck. And um, she will join us. She recently um, received the prestigious Denk Prize from the GHO in Hamburg uh, for her work on high resolution single cell atlas in non small cell lung cancer. And I guess she will give us perspective number two. So thank you um, for the invitation. You see my slide? Okay. Um, so now I'm going to talk about the perspective two um, on acquired IO resistance. Um, we've heard a lot about T cell infiltration in the first talk. So my perspective is going to be a little bit more about the myeloid compartment, particularly about um, neutrophils. Um, so when you look at the graph on the left hand side, you can see um, that in the dark blue circles, in non-small cell lung cancer, the rate of acquired uh, IO resistance is quite high, and it associates with a worse overall response, much more compared to other tumor entities. And since 2023, we finally have a definite um, and official definition of what the differences between primary and secondary IO resistance are. And in the secondary resistance setting, we're talking about patients that have received IO resistance, responded to it, and then became um, responded to it over six months and then became progressive. Uh, we've already heard a little bit about the mechanisms of um, IO resistance. It's important to understand that there are tumor intrinsic IO resistance mechanisms. Um, these are mechanisms that are derived from the tumor self itself, and they can be either primary or secondary. And there are also tumor cell extrinsic mechanisms, and these extrinsic mechanisms derive from cells that are are in the tumor microenvironment, not from the tumor cell itself. And in this regard, I will talk about the myeloid um, uh, cell compartment. And it's important to mention here that in the tumor cell extrinsic um, IO resistance setting, it's not so clear if these mechanisms are actually primary or acquired or, or secondary. So why do I talk about neutrophils? Um, first, it's important um, that in the literature, different names are being used for the cell type. So um, I will talk about neutrophils, but um, they are also referred to as tumor-associated neutrophils or TAN or as MDCs, myeloid-derived suppre uh, myeloid suppressor cells. So in the non-small cell lung cancer tumor microenvironment, neutrophils are a very important cell population. They compose about 8 to 20% of all lymphocytes, uh, of all uh, leukocytes, sorry. And it's particularly important to know that um, neutrophil infiltration is a problem of squamous cell carcinoma patients. And this is also something I will talk about later. Um, what are myeloid derived suppressor cells actually? So um, there are different definitions, but um, at the end, myeloid derived suppressor cells are a subtype of neutrophils that have uh, an immunosuppressive and immature phenotype. And they're primarily found in cancer patients um, in the tumor self, uh, in the tumor tissue itself, but also in the blood. And we know that neutrophils or MDSCs have different functions. Um, they can be pro-tumor primarily by T cell suppression or um, tumor cell differentiation. Um, and but they can also be anti-tumor uh, or have an anti-tumor phenotype by, for example, priming T cells. And so there are different um, mechanisms how neutrophils can actually interfere with immunotherapy resistance. So the most important um, part is probably that they are immunosuppressive, as I said before, and they lead to an immune exclusion. On the other hand, they can also, um, uh, uh, they are involved in tumor neoangiogenesis. For example, pathological vasculature in the tumors leads to the problem that immune cells can't infiltrate the tumor anymore, but also VGFA. Um, an important pro-angiogenic factor, is actually immunosuppressive itself. And also there are many cancer cell intrinsic characteristics that are associated with neutrophils, particularly SDK11 mutations, which I'm also going to talk about later. So first I'm going to talk about the immunocell, immune cell suppressive mechanisms of neutrophils. So what we see clinically is that patients, um, in this, um, when you look at the blood from pre-treatment IO patients, you can see that when they have a high ratio of neutrophils to lymphocytes, that this associates with worse overall survival, worse overall response rates, and um, less clinical benefit. And this is very clearly seen in different cancer entities. 
There's also been um, this so-called lung immune prognostic index um, done by the group of Benjamin Bisset. Um, they combined the neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio with the LDH level pre-treatment um, to IO. And they also could see that if you have a high um, LIP index, that's what they call it, um, you um, can actually stratify patients in uh, whether they respond, will respond to immunotherapy or not. Um, this can also actually be seen in um, the mouse model. This is very interesting. There was a group from Julia Kargel. Um, she's working in Graz. They used a mouse model of squamous cell carcinoma um, that have an SDK11 mutation, which is characterized by a high neutrophil infiltration. And they treated the mice with anti-PD-1 antibody or anti-PD-1 antibody with um, a CXCR1 or 2 inhibitor, which inhibits neutrophils or the CXC1 or 2 inhibitor alone. And what they found is when you combine these two strategies, you can actually restore the infiltration of CD8 T cells. Um, as you can see here by the index or only by the CD8 um, T cells alone, you can restore the infiltration. And only the combination of these two um, therapies was able to significantly reduce the tumor burden. On the other hand, um, it's probably not only the pretreatment neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio that predicts you if um, patients respond to immunotherapy or not, but it also seems that somehow the trend of these cells during the immunotherapy matters. So if you look on the left-hand side, for example, this has been a meta-analysis of NSCLC patients, um, and uh, they found that those patients that have an increase of neutrophils before the second um, cycle of IO, that they have a significantly worse overall survival PFS and overall response response rate compared to those patients that have a decrease in the neutrophils um, before the second IO cycle. On the other hand, um, this is, of course, a different entity. This is um, small cell lung cancer. But this group found, and this is completely different, that um, patients, when they got um, radiochemotherapy and had an increase in neutrophils after radiochemotherapy, this um, was associated with a significantly better PFS after the adjuvant IO. So my conclusion from these different results is that actually the neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio alone represents a suboptimal marker as different clinical situations depend on distinct neutrophil subtypes, which are yet incompletely displayed by the neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio. And so this brings me to the topic of neutrophil diversity. Um, this concept has only been uh, if evolving over the last years. And we actually know now that neutrophils are not just one population, but actually have a variety of different functions in the tumor microenvironment. Most of the functions that have been characterized over the last years are actually pro-tumor functions, as I already said before. For example, they can promote a metastasis. Um, they can be directly cytotoxic. They are associated with interfering gamma-dependent immune responses, et cetera. And, um, Contrarily, they uh, neutrophils, some subpopulation of neutrophils have actually also been associated with antitumor uh, phenotypes or functions, particularly by activating antitumor adaptive immunity. And this um, was only or is being better understood at the moment. Uh, uh, in 2023, there were two uh, major publications in Cell that both showed that specific subtypes of neutrophils can um, activate T cells and help to attack the cancer. For example, the one um, paper um, by Gunga B. Soon, uh, you can see here on the left-hand side, they found that certain um, subsets of neutrophils are um, increasing and expanding in those patients that um, respond to immunotherapy. And those um, neutrophils have a strong signature of interferon, of interferon um, uh, responding genes, actually. And the other paper by um, David Hirschhorn, they found that um, there are some subsets of neutrophils that are able to kill those cancer cells that lose their antigens and are therefore invisible to T cells. And this mechanism has been associated with NO secretion by the um, neutrophils. So these um, papers just um, begin to uh, describe mechanisms that are anti-tumor. Um, there's one very interesting paper published in pancreatic cancer that tries to explain why there are different neutrophil subsets in the tumor microenvironment. And I'm sure that this doesn't only refer to pancreatic cancer, but maybe different tumor entities. And they describe that um, probably normal neutrophils from the periphery, um, they enter the tumor microenvironment. They are first in a kind of transitional zone, but then uh, in response to different factors from the tumor microenvironment, 
they uh, become to different uh, um, subsets, for example, they become um, classically pro-tumor neutrophils with a strong VGFA expression and high glycolytic activity, maybe in response to hypoxia or cancer cell intrinsic signaling. But they can also become um, maybe anti-tumor neutrophil subsets with uh, strong interference stimulated gene expression, maybe uh, in response to immunotherapy. So this we, we don't know um, until the end. In our own um, studies, so this is uh, single cell sequencing data from non-small cell lung cancer, and we characterize different subsets of neutrophils as well. And you can see here, um, these NANs, they are normal neutrophils, and these TANs are rather um, uh, typical neutrophils that are found in the tumor. And we found that these NANs um, actually um, transition to different subtypes of TANs. Uh, we also found pro-angiogenic um, TANs, but also interferon-simulated gene um, um, NANs. And so this is a, um, a trajectory that neutrophils undergo in the tumor microenvironment. Environment. Um, so this brings me um, to the topic of neutrophil biomarkers again. Probably the neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio alone is not specific enough for the different cl clinical situations we have. So there was one very interesting post at ASCO this year um, that showed that there's a, a, a subset of neutrophils with a strong interference stimulated signature in the in the blood of patients um, as a prognostic or predictive marker for immunotherapy response. And in our um, own work, we defined a gene signature of 38 genes. Um, these genes are highly specific for neutrophils. You can see here on the left-hand side, um, these are all cells in the tumor microenvironment. And only these um, cell cluster here, which are the neutrophils, only they express these genes. And we found that those patients that have a high expression of these 38 neutrophils um, gene signature, they um, respond significantly worse um, to immunotherapy with atezolizumab, and this wasn't found in chemotherapy. And the effect was particularly strong in squamous cell carcinoma patients. And of course, it will not be possible in the clinic to measure a 38 gene transcriptomic signature, but these analyses just show us that um, for different situations, we need maybe more specified um, biomarkers. Um, now I'm going to come to the um, second part about uh, the tumor neoangiogenesis. Um, so we know that neutrophils are a very important promoter of angiogenesis in the tumor microenvironment, uh, particularly by expression of VGFA. Um, we looked at um, this also in our own data. Here you can see on the right-hand side the different cell populations in the tumor microenvironment and how much VGFA they express. And you can actually see that neutrophils are one of those cell populations that express the highest amount of VGF VGFA, um, even more than cancer cells themselves. So there's the question, can maybe the addition of anti-angiogenic treatment help to overcome IO resistance? Um, this is also uh, has been regarded as angioimmunogenic switch. And there's the question, which patient subgroups could actually benefit from this um, anti angioimmunogenic switch? And so maybe these could be patients that have a high rate of angiogenesis. Um, this could be patients with squamous cell carcinoma histology, because we know uh, what combines them is a high um, neutrophil infiltration. And so there has been one very interesting study published um, last year. It's the so-called lung map study. It was a phase two randomized study um, in advanced non-small cell lung cancer patients that had um, previous treatment with immunotherapy and chemotherapy. So this was a study that investigated the setting of acquired IO resistance. And the patients were stratified to um, a standard arm uh, that was docetaxel ramocirumab or docetaxel or gamcitabine uh, or pavitrexet alone. And the investigational arm was again uh, fembolizumab and uh, ramocirumab. And so what this study found um, was that after medium follow-up follow -up of about 18 months, that um, the combination of ramocirumab and vampolizumab as second-line therapy in acquired IO resistance was um, able to significantly um, improve the medium overall survival by 14.5 um, to 11.6 months. Um, and this was actually quite interesting that in the standard of care arm, um, 45 patients actually received um, already ramocirumab. And when you look at the subgroup analysis, of course, this is very um, uh, preliminary because um, these were very small patient numbers, but those patients that particularly benefited from this um, therapy were patients with squamous cell carcinoma histology and also um, patients that had, had an SDK11 or KEEP1 mutation, which I'm uh, going to co come to in the next part. 
Um, so these um, phase two data are currently being evaluated in the phase three Pragmatica lung trial. Um, what's um, the negative point um, from this slide is that there have um, been recent phase three trial results that actually evaluated uh, angiogenic, uh, anti-angiogenic treatment in a second line um, therapy, therapy situation after immunotherapy. Um, for example, the Sapphire one uh, Sapphire study that investigated only non-squamous cell carcinoma patients, and they investigated the um, uh, citravatinib um, plus nivolumab versus docetaxel alone. Um, this was actually quite an interesting med um, drug because it was also shown to um, suppress myeloid derived suppressor cells, but unfortunately, this study was negative. Maybe um, one critical point is that they only investigated non squamous cell carcinoma patients. On the other hand, there was um, the LEAP08 um, study that investigated both histologies. It was a study of bembolizumab plus um, lenvatinib versus docetaxel. And again, unfortunately, this study was negative. And, for, and also the contract one study um, that investigated atitulizumab and cabozantinib, that's also a multi drug uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitor versus docetaxel, was negative. So there's um, for sure sure several things we do not understand at the moment and many patient subgroups that um, have to be investigated in more detail in the future to understand which patients benefit from anti-angiogenic treatment. And now I'm going to come to the last part, um, which um, is the cancer cell intrinsic characteristic of STK11 mutations and how this is associated with neutrophils. So we know that um, STK11 mutated NSCLC um, tumors are immunologically cold, they lack T cell infiltration. And we also know that patients that have an STK11 mutation, they um, respond less to immunotherapy, even though when, um, they are PDL1 positive, um, which you can see here in these slides. And also, this has been um, translated to a worse overall survival. And of course, this has also something to do with neutrophils, because otherwise I wouldn't mention it. We know from mouse models that um, lung cancers that have an SDK11 mutation have significantly higher amounts of TANS or neutrophils in their tumors, and also have um, lower abundances of CD8 T cells. And those T cells that are present have an exhausted phenotype. Um, what's important to mention here, uh, SDK11 mutation is a bad prognostic marker across different therapies. So this doesn't only relate to immunotherapy, which you can see here, but also it really uh, it has been observed in chemotherapy and in anti-VGFA um, targeted therapies or um, EGFR tyrosine kinase inhibitors. So it's not a predictive marker for immunotherapy alone. And so SDK11 mutations and um, similarly KEEP1 mutations should not be used to exclude patients from ICI um, treatment. That's very important. And so I want to uh, finally come to um, the Poseidon study um, because this um, study answers um, some open questions. It's a phase three um, randomized open label study um, in first line um, metastatic NSCLC and it evaluated the combination of tremelimumab, dovalumab and chemotherapy versus dovalumab and uh, chemotherapy versus chemotherapy alone. And one of the major findings of this study actually was that um, patients that have an SDK11 mutation significantly benefit from the addition of CTLA4 inhibitors, which you can see um, here. And those patients that um, are SDK11 wild type, they don't really benefit from the addition of um, premilimumab. And similar, you can see in KEEP1 mutated patients. So um, maybe this uh, subgroup of SDK11 and KEEP1 mutated patients um, is the subgroup that particularly benefits from an additional immunotherapy. And so this brings me to my conclusion. Um, I think um, neutrophils, TANs, or NDCs, however you wouldn't want to call them, are a major cell population in the non-small cell lung cancer tumor microenvironment, particularly in patients that have squamous cell carcinoma histology. A high neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio is a validated prognostic marker, but with regards to immunotherapy, I think it's not always specific enough. Uh, we know that specific neutrophil subsets or neutrophil functions may induce IO sensitivity, not only resistance, per, uh, and this can happen in the primary or secondary resistance setting. And therapeutic options to overcome um, neutrophil-induced immunotherapy resistance are yet to be investigated, maybe um, CTLA-4 inhibitors, maybe neutrophil-depleting agents, or maybe anti-angiogenic uh, agents in certain subgroups of patients. Thank you for your attention.
Dear Dr. Howard, congratulations to your work and this uh, brilliant insight. Thanks so much for that. In the interest of time, and since there are no questions from the Q&A session, I will uh, hand over uh, my chair to Dominic Wolf. Dominic, it's your part.